Well, let's uh, let's get things started. And uh, good morning to everyone. Hello, how's everybody doing? Good morning, sir. What's up? The mic here. I, uh, I you know, we're, we're talking about movies here briefly before we get started here, but uh, I, I had a, a rare occurrence here. Like I bought a CD over the weekend. Well, it oh, arrived. How retro. Yeah. Sorry, what? Yeah, what's that? There's an acronym there I didn't quite pick up. I know. So this is, you can tell what it is. This is um, obscure uh, mid '80s. This is uh, the. It's a. It's a double album because I'm trying. Was trying to find their first album, uh, Fruer, hmm. and they morphed and became the band Underworld. And wow. in the early '90s, uh, they had a couple really big singles, uh, and then they kind of changed the lineup, and they are the modern. Underworld, which is more dance music, guitar driven with Carl Hyde and and uh, Rick Smith. Darren Emerson. Yeah, well, he left. Yeah, but after what two albums, three albums or something? Not quite sure. Early on, but uh, but yeah. So anyway, well, hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the Microsoft Community Office Hours, where we will be discussing all things Microsoft 365. If we must. And, if we must. <laughs> That's what we are. We are. You know phone to do. Uh, answering questions from the community, my name is Christian Buckley. I'm an Office Apps and Services MVP and Regional Director uh, based in Lehigh, Utah, and I'm the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director at AvPoint. And oh, hey, he joined earlier. Joining me today are uh, Sean McDonough, a consultant with Bitstream Foundry in Cincinnati, Ohio, and an Office Apps and Services MVP. Howdy. Mike Nelson, a solutions architect with Pure Storage and a Cloud and Data Center Management MVP based in Appleton, Wisconsin. Hal Hostetler, a senior field engineer with Roland Shore and Tower in Tucson, Arizona, and an Office Apps and Services MVP. Eric Riz, founder and CEO of Empty Cubicle and an Office Apps and Services MVP based out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, we have Sherry Oswald. Hello, a Microsoft certified mm -hmm. trainer, Microsoft <laughs> Office Master, and co-founder of Power Up Learning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we have Dr. Neil Hodgkinson, a Microsoft Senior Program Manager, and um, and and if anything goes wrong with any Microsoft technology, he's our uh, punching bag. <laughs> and, uh, yes, the esteemed Doctor Neil. <laughs> well, it's great to see all the uh, the happy smiling faces this morning. Any anything exciting going on today, this week? Uh, yeah, virtual marathon. Hello. Yes. That's right. <laughs> the, if you're not familiar, so the Microsoft 365 virtual marathon going on this week uh and so i've got a session tomorrow i have to, i should probably look you should probably look. you should know <laughs> that that's a very think... important thing to know yeah and check can... time zones when you're looking so that you know which time zone you should be you know <laughs> in but it's free so people should go sign up and a lot of great content um i've got tweet jam happening tomorrow as well so where my it's my session's on Wednesday. There, dude. I have a session. It was so. Yeah, well, tomorrow, hopefully, uh, most of you, I know Mike doesn't care about this stuff, but it's the um, it's whether customers are still asking which tool to use when. Um, and, and so Why would I, I not care about that, Christian? I, I, you know, so I, I, I <laughs> so let me, let me, let me go backwards on that. I'll claim that question back. It's got nothing because, to do with telephony. It's got nothing to do with SharePoint. So I'm that's cool. true. No, well, it could be SharePoint related. Maybe. Maybe people have questions that they're confused about. It's the question like, well, I've got SharePoint. Why do I need Teams? Or I'm using Teams. Why do I need SharePoint? What's this Yammer thing still doing here? When do I use OneDrive? Kind of all those questions. And that was a, a question that was discussed a lot uh, frequently. 
and uh, Microsoft hated hearing that. There, there was the messaging that they came out with a couple years back, which was the inner loop, outer loop to help explain when you shift between tools. Uh, yes, uh, another analogy. Yeah, I, I actually liked that messaging, but. I like that. I still use that depending on I, the client. So, yeah, so do I. So with that, I think it's, uh, let's do the official theme music for Mike's Microsoft 365 Message Center. This just in. For Mike. Wow. We've got quite the budget, Mike. That's 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 an all new low there for Christian. I don't know. Even for you, Christian. What about the disclaimer? Oh yeah, we should. We should start with the disclaimer here for people that are watching the live stream. So yes, that's, you know, just make sure that legally we're covered here. No puppies were harmed in the making of this webcast. As far as we know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Over so, you, uh, yeah, so let's go through some uh, new Microsoft Message Center updates along with a couple of roadmap items that are compiled for today. Um, anybody know what the GCC is or the GCC high is? Neil, you can't answer this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody knows you're all shaking your heads. Uh, Sean looks confused as always. Uh, but it's uh, GCC is the government cloud, right? So you have the government cloud and then you have something called a GCC high, which I guess is like, you know, it must be super secret classified. Hi. Yeah, kind of like, I did a lot, you know, of, work wow. with, I did a lot of work with the Department of Defense. So these are the people defending our country. So yeah, yeah. it's GCC, probably Skynet yeah. too, right? So it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The NSA, bugging phones, all that kind of fun stuff. Yep. Uh, so they're making a whole bunch of stuff available on the roadmap. Uh, this past week, they've they've like, it, there's a barrage of of things that are being enabled, but they're only being enabled in the government cloud. And they're things that I think that should be enabled for everybody, but for some reason they're all GCC or GCC high. They're not hitting the general the general public cloud, if you will. They gotta throw uh, those guys a bone. I'll tell you, they they have such a Maybe Whittled it's like down a, version of Office 365. Maybe yeah, maybe it's a budget cycle where they they're trying to get you know some government cash flowing in and say I don't know. But what they're doing is a, a couple of things. Uh, I'll go over uh, the message center thing and then I'll hit the roadmap a little bit later. But um, the Exchange Admin Center. I don't know if everybody's used the EAC, but sometimes it can be like really somewhat confusing. And it's gone through years and years of iterations, but it's gotten better. Um, they're actually creating a new, whole new portal now. So it's going to be like brand new. Um, they're taking all the classic out of there and they're actually going to have the migration assistance. So they're actually adding a tenant to tenant migration wizard and an automated G Suite migration wizard, um, personalized dashboards and insights and all this other kind of fun stuff. So it's really turning in from more of a, hey, we kind of hodgepodge this together from the on prem. Exchange Center admin, and we put it together, and now we're we're actually putting some really good functionality into it. But once again, they're only giving it to the GCC and the uh, GCC High. Uh, hopefully, that will change. Uh, so there's another thing that's coming down the pipe here um, that I wanted to come up with is that you can set an audit office with Microsoft Teams now. So why did this take so long? Please help me understand this. Um, you're talking about an Office product, and they're now coming out with this update that allows you to set out of Office within Teams. Um, the it, implementers were out of Office. Yeah, I just I'm not quite understanding a collaborative tool that you could never set. You could do that with Skype. Why couldn't you do it with Teams? And I guess you know it's one of those things where I'm just kind of shaking my head. So I, are you know, we just, are we finally seeing parity with Skype? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know, it, it just it just seems really weird. It's kind of like this next one too, because who knew that in Microsoft Forms, what's what it's one of the biggest pet peeves you have with Microsoft Forms? Name one, just name one. Pet peeves? I don't know. Yeah. I love everything. So, uh, oh, no, uh, the fact that you have quizzes and you can't post the. Um, score from the quiz questions into a mm. SharePoint list. Yep. It doesn't no, do the role. I'm, I'm going much more basic than that. Oh, All right. No. So does anybody realize that you can't even change the font, like from bold oh. to italics to underline? You can't add bullets. You can't add numbering. Anything so 
basic in an editor. You can't do that. It doesn't come um, in purple. Yeah, now they're actually adding the ability to do text formatting in in Microsoft Forms. Yeah. Uh, I always, I, I mean, I have filled, I have created forms, and it always kind of like upset me that I couldn't like. I wanted to bold something. Oh no, you can't bold. I'm like, what? This is a Microsoft app. I can't bold something in a Microsoft app. Come on. I, 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 why why does it just does it not just have that rich editor capability? Why can't I add an image or a if I want to have a short video? Like you can attach content. Yeah. So you can post a link or attach content to go outside that. But what if I want to, as part of my quiz, part of the test, part of the survey, you know, point to like a short video on YouTube that explains the the, the topic or gives a background and then ask the question. Yeah, these are well, all things. That's what the subtitles for. <laughs> that's what the subtitles for. Yeah. That's right. To explain the depth of the question. <laughs> oh, there's a title and a subtitle. I missed that. Yes. <laughs> you can use that in your 20, 20 uh, productivity tips on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it yeah. is Wednesday, by the way. I was making sure you and I weren't competing with each other again. So. <laughs> yeah, no worries. All right. Keeping up with the same, keeping up with the Joneses theme we're going on here. Um, they've actually put it a ability to prevent attendees from sharing video feeds in teams. You know, I think other collaboration tools have had this for like years. Um, the ability to turn off other people's video feeds as a presenter, but. You know, like, Hey, Hal, you're having a bad hair day. I'm yeah. going to shut off your video. Right. Right. Yeah. You can't, <laughs> you know, so that's actually coming coming to be a real thing uh, along hair. with yeah <laughs> hair, uh, yes big hair christian don't pick on the follically challenged okay it's really just inappropriate <laughs> that's really well, that, yes. well there's a little bit there that's why i, I wasn't poking fun at sean <laughs> Jeez. all right Sorry. so uh mm -hmm. and this one coming from the department of this meeting could have been an email uh exchange online we're going to get back to that it's okay, a huge so, department by the way yeah it is it's a huge department in microsoft um so it's funded by the bill and melinda gates foundation by the way <laughs> okay. so a new commandlet to make meetings shorter by default so they're actually created a powershell commandlet that will go through all of your meetings and make them shorter yeah so if you make a meeting 60 minutes It'll drop a few minutes off the ending of the meeting. Yep. So when you go over, you're even more over now. <laughs> yep. I had to laugh at this one because I'm like, really? People do people even 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 stick to team meeting times? I mean, they always everybody used to say, hey, you know what? You start at 15 minutes past the hour, you end at at uh, 15 minutes to the hour, and everybody seems more productive. Well, well now, now you can set as an admin. You can set a global policy to shorten everyone's events. Yeah. So is there, everyone, is there a global policy, Mike, for eliminating the words, I'm going to give you X minutes back now? Because <laughs> this, is, this is a huge, yeah, huge it's, pet peeve right, of mine. It's okay? right next to the one where you're on mute. So if you give me 15 minutes back, it's because you didn't plan properly. And now you messed up my whole day and possibly my hey, week, I, maybe I, even my month. I, your feng shui has been does, thrown. That's right. Mike, does, does it like shorten every single meeting in the calendar? So what if, like, for example, if a, a lot of my meetings are set up by external people, right? Like this one, for example. Yeah. You know, this is this is set up by Christian. So if I run this PowerShell command or this PowerShell policy thing is, is executed against my mailbox, right, which has my calendar items in it, does it include shortening external every... events or just the ones I own? You know, it just says your events. Uh, that's all the detail it gives. It says with this commandlet, you can end your events a few minutes early. So I have a feeling it's only events that you create. Now, okay. does it say that? Does it say that in bold or Alex highlight anything? <laughs> or is it just straight up text? So, so let me take the other position. Like I actually like this feature. I know it's it's not a big mind blowing thing. It's part of the. So I read about this last week. Uh, it, it, so I knew it, knew it was coming, but there was an article that I've got. I think I actually have it open somewhere in a browser uh, uh, looking at the various tips and things uh, that I might add into my session this week uh, around the the kind of the wellness and, you know, the, the, the 
you know, work from home changes, the adaptations. This is something, it's not so much about the fact that it ends five minutes early. It's that, it, it, you know, so then you get the five minute warning um, five minutes earlier. It's just, it, it's prompting people to, it's trying to build in automation. You don't have to do it. You don't have to leverage that. Um, but it's prompting people to take a little more time to take breaks in between meetings. The reality is that we schedule things back to back to back to back. That's how my days are set up. Uh, all of our days are set up. And and there's often not enough time, even with the five minute warning, to adjust, you know, change direction, get ready for that next meeting. And so it's giving you another tool to to kind of force you to take that break to recognize, hey, I need to have a couple minutes to go refresh the ice cubes in my beverage container here sitting on my desk. Or, well, uh, you know, just get rid well, of that. Yeah, and they give an example here. They said, right, so for example, you can make all meetings under 60 minutes start late with a five minute break. And then all meetings 60 minutes or over start late with a 10 minute break. Yep. So what they're saying is if you have back to back to back meetings, you know, you start with a five minute break. So at least you get to go do those things. But this is this is org wide. This is for everyone in your organization. Yep. And yeah. some folks, you know, I, I see problems with this. I mean, I see I see an issue if an admin decides, hey, I'm going to enable this for everybody. Not everybody's going to be in line with this whole. Why is my meeting start at six oh five? And why you know, is it, why is my why is it a setting like the reminder? Like you can determine how much of a reminder you want by default yeah. every right. your meetings. Why isn't it that? Or at the core of it, it's a human problem. You're trying to use <laughs> technology to solve a people problem, and that's you yeah. know you're just going to be even more skewed now. I'm just going to start scheduling 65 minute meetings. <laughs> <laughs> That'll solve that problem. Or how yeah. about 63 and a half or something? Yeah. Just to Bank make it. error in your favor. Collect 200. Yeah. Uh, so the meeting, the, the, the variation in time is set by the admin. So you can put like two minutes in there. You could put like 10 minutes in there. You can do whatever. But that could get, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be the admin that actually implements that. I mean, that, that that's no. going to turn into a very long day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if it's like do their five minutes. Yeah, especially if it's like a global company wide policy, because you might want people. Yeah. I mean, is my CVP going to be happy if I suddenly cramp his meeting times? And well, probably actually, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, because some people, and meetings have different purposes, right? So some yeah. meetings are, you know, deep engineering meetings where there's lots of discussion. You need every single minute. Stand ups. Oh, you know. Just, Stand up, ten minutes, man. You're ten minutes yep. in, and you're ten minutes, and you're out, and that's it. And mm -hmm. you know, if you cut, the, if you say, "Oh, we're going to start at ten o three, you know, <laughs> you're going to have people yeah. going. I'm just going mean, to sit I, here for three minutes <laughs> and I, waste my time. I, yeah, I mean, I I <laughs> manually actually, when I create meetings with my customers or with internal meetings with my teams. I, I actually don't I set the meeting for to start at five past the hour and end at five to the hour. Always it's a 50 minute meeting. I do that because it's horrible when I have to jump back to back to back and I've got I'm taking notes and documentation and then I get to the end of the day and I've been in like seven hours of meetings nonstop and all of a sudden I've got to convert all my notes into something that makes sense because I'll just forget what I wrote tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I've slept between now and then. It's <laughs> like one of those things. And you probably at some point have to use the bathroom in seven hours. This is also true. You know, personal yeah, business is very important. Maybe I, not. Maybe I, not, I, Eric. I have a, I, I have a personal commode. Yeah, you might have. You might this have. Is not, you know. This is not a chair I'm sitting on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a throne. It's a throne. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, I got to get through these uh, exclude. Okay, so things that make you go. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's see. Um, well, let, let's or, let's be the judge hmm. of that. You tell us what the item is, and then we'll. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. This is this is any Mac heads. We got any Mac heads? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're so, the stylish. I'm, come on. Figures. Figures. Come on. I know. I know. Yeah. Wait. Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Hipster me, Santa there. Yeah. A sec. Let me let me get focused. Oh. Okay. I'm, I'm you I just threw you. up a little bit in my mouth. Now I can now I can both see Sorry. and hear, which is wonderful. Please, by all means. So, 
I, I'm a hybrid, right? So I have a Mac sitting here and then I do everything on a PC. So I, I do both. But um, so when I say this to you, uh, exclude specific files from OneDrive sync on Mac OS. From a Mac perspective, the, the only thing is, is that this policy goes by uh, a file extension. From a Mac perspective, there is no such thing as a file extension. Hmm. So I'm trying to understand, I'm going, hmm, how are they going to do this? Because from a, when you're looking at a Mac, you don't have extensions on. Hmm. And Mac files don't usually save with an extension. So how is OneNote going to know <laughs> What the extension is in order to exclude it, or I mean OneDrive. How is it going to know to what to exclude? Anyone? <laughs> I I don't know anything really about Max at all. Um, but when you say they don't have extensions, is it not that they don't have like are they, they have like hidden extensions? So if you no. said like a Word doc, you tell me it doesn't no. have a dot doc X. No, it associates the file based off of the file type. So it has an internal database which is called the system library. And that system library associates a, uh, a, a specific signature of a file to an application. So when you create like a Word file, there's no doc or docx extension. It just knows that it's a Word file because it's inside of that internal database that associates. So, yeah. So, so is OneDrive sync engine for Max able to read that database and therefore understand what? It says this setting lets you enter keywords to prevent the OneDrive sync app from uploading certain files to OneDrive or SharePoint. Now, you can enter complete names, such as setup.exe, which makes no sense on a Mac because there's no such thing as an exe, or use an asterisk as a wildcard character represent a series of characters, such as star.pst. So, <laughs> this, is, this is like a person who works on the Windows team wrote this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it just, I don't get it. All right. Nothing from risk. Okay. Well, I, I uh, I'm gonna, I, yeah, I'm gonna volunteer for some homework. I, I happen to know the head technical engineer in MacBook in Microsoft in Remond, um, and he's kind of in. He does all of the uh, platform and synchronization and testing work for every single version of current currently supported Mac OSs and devices. So let guy. me reach out to him. Let me reach out to him and ask him, see if he knows anything about it. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, Mike, right. I didn't I didn't know some of the background information that you were sharing there around how a file name is associated to a file and engines and such. I mean, from a front end perspective, when you when you open up Finder, you see all the extensions and you see the kinds. They don't call them extensions, they just call them it's the, the kind field. Right. So of course they got their own term. Of that naturally, yes. Yeah. But there, so, when you look at the file itself, it's there's no like name dot dot x doc x or anything there like is. that. There is. Well, if you turn them on, yes, Eric, there is. See? But by default, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, a couple more things. Got to get through this. Uh, SharePoint and Teams. Uh, and I, I, th I think we talked about this at one point. There's a folder. The folder can now be uh, visible. So a folder in a site is visibly connected to a channel. Um, so the Teams release will make it easy to tell which folders within your SharePoint library have a Teams channel associated with them. Okay. Uh, additionally, you'll be able to see this right from within the SharePoint user interface. This new feature will roll out to Teams desktop and web. Is that something, Sherry, John, that you, know, you see a lot of, that people are like, hey, is there a team associated with this? Well, from the like SharePoint little, side? Yeah, if there's like a little icon or something on it, kind of like there'd be like a like something that's locked, that's private, you know, or you know, have a little padlock or something. If there's a visual cue there, because I've heard that question from people, like they're confused about you know which is which. And uh so I think that's a as, as long as it's not becoming like a uh MySpace type thing with little animated gifts all over SharePoint, you know. <laughs> yeah. With that all these different funny. indicators. That would be funny. <laughs> to me, there's the best practices if you have a team enabled SharePoint site, the document library by default is used and a new folder is created every time a channel is created. You don't add additional folders to that library. You create another library. That's my but, they, but don't and, mess and, with them. 
But what this is getting at is that there's no visibility. Yeah. The, the link between the two. So when you're in SharePoint, you don't know whether or not there's, whether there's, there's teams behind it, a teams channel that's sitting behind that that library. Just and when you're in thing. teams, you don't know if there's a, a SharePoint what SharePoint library is associated with that team. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that. It'd be nice to have a little visual indicator, like yeah. like you're saying, like the private channels have the little lock on it. I'm I yeah. totally agree with that. But it in you just shouldn't mix it up because if somebody comes in and creates a channel with the same name that somebody created a folder in your document yeah. library, yeah. you're now going to get one of those mm -hmm. nasty. Yep. Either it's not going to work, it's going to fail, or you're going to get the, one of those really long nasty folder names. So binary just, explosive, bring the two <laughs> together and boom. <laughs> exactly. So I, I don't know. I just I don't mess with that document library if it's a Teams enabled SharePoint site. But that's but that's me. <laughs> All right, um, so we got a new SharePoint Live presentation option coming, uh, and this one is really cool uh, because you have the ability now to, uh, with desktop and window sharing, you open up uh, Teams, okay, and you open <clears throat> up PowerPoint Live, and now in PowerPoint Live, you can embed your Teams video. So it's kind of like, a, you know, the whole green screen effect where, you you know, if you're it's using like, a, like OBS. It's OBS, right. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. But now you have to use Teams and PowerPoint online together. All right. So it's not in a single app. Like I would think from a PowerPoint desktop app perspective, you should be able to use this as well. But they're saying it's only available in uh, PowerPoint Live on the web. So just know. wait for PowerPoint Live for the web pro. Yeah, and then there we'll you go. do all that. There you go. I think all you right. mean. Do you mean business, Christian, or pro? Uh, for well, there's those are two different SKUs, Eric. Uh, well, naturally, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate to get technical, but and then there's the small business SKU of yeah. Anyway, yeah. Okay, I got two two roadmap items, and then I'm done. I'm out of your hair. Uh, first, first one is an, again GCC. GCC is only getting this. I don't know why. Sorry, that was another. I just want to point out that was another slam on. It was. It is. The fall it's definitely channel. a slam. It definitely is. Um, Microsoft Teams live transcript for Teams meetings. Okay, so live transcripts is coming, and you have the ability to see them live, but you also have the ability to download them after the fact, uh, nice. but only for GCC. Mm. Almost nice. <laughs> Don't know why. Um, last thing: uh, Exchange and Outlook for Business. Now, this is, I think this is really cool because if you work in an instit institution or a business that allows for um, when you book a meeting, if you're Microsoft Campus, perfect example, you book a meeting, it's over in building 92 or it's over in building whatever. Um, the only thing is, is you book that meeting, you have to book walk time or you have to book shuttle time to get to that, right? Well, that's not part of the booking now. They're giving you the ability to book time and travel and transportation along with a meeting. So <laughs> you book a meeting, they're going to give you the, hey, do you need transportation. If your organization has, you know, the transportation resources set up, you can book those um, along with it and, you know, have your time uh, allocated correctly rather than trying to piece it all together. I'm really surprised that Microsoft would come out with this this feature. Um, I mean, because insiders are well aware of this, of the uh, vast network of pneumatic tubes underneath uh, Microsoft's <laughs> campus in between their campuses. So you get in the pod. You have to you have to have your hands crossed across your chest for safety. Keep your hands in and hands hands in your side. And yeah. and feet crossed like you do when you yeah. go rafting, right? What about the transporter though? <laughs> Even though only there's only a couple offices that have the transporter. You know, that's obviously reserved. Sachi's got one, of course. The, you know. And a bad uh, tree you just taps it and goes beam yeah. me up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well one thing you know, and it was I know it's not it's been out for like a well, it's a few days. It was in the updates. Was the delay of the uh, shared channels really disappointed that that got pushed out? Anybody see that notification? Yep. Yeah. So it's, to, I think November. Yeah, it's like uh, they moved everything down. I, I don't know if you follow. And one thing I've noticed about the channel updates, uh, and not only because when you get the message center updates in 365, you're not 
the when you do that publicly, you're not actually seeing all the channel updates. Um, there are channel updates that if you are, you guys are M, you know, M365 MVPs, but there are channel updates that are only visible on the back end, right? There are some updates that the public can't see. And some of them I've noticed when you start seeing all of these, everything is getting pushed. It's like, I, I haven't seen anything hit a timeline because everything comes up and it's updated, updated timeline, updated timeline, updated timeline. It's like, you know, keep pushing till the end of the year, folks. We got stuff that was ready to go in February that's now pushed until May. So they need to <laughs> practice kind of the project management, you know, yeah. uh, the 101, which is, you know, what is it? You know, whatever your estimate, time estimate, you know, make it two and a half times. Yeah. And that's the, the reality. Add, add so 20%. They're, they're yeah. using planner and everybody randomly changes the due dates on their tasks in planner instead of having right. Microsoft project. Where and there's no history of that change. <laughs> so you don't know that. Was that the change? It's like, oh yeah. Yeah. That was, that was always the delivery <laughs> date. On well, well, your other thing is put, put yourself in my shoes, right? I'm, I run, I'm in, I'm in like ring zero dog. How big are your feet, Neil? How big are your feet? Size 10. <laughs> Ten and a half. I see, US. I'm a thirteen, so I wouldn't fit. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, apparently everything's bigger in the U.S. So. <laughs> Especially in Texas. Um, yeah. Size does uh, matter. Yeah, you know, Easy, we, we, when, when, when I'm we, not. When we, I'm not touching that. I'm not. Touching when, when we project a date for a potential shipping, you know, you've got to remember that that every single person or most people inside Microsoft, we get we get hammered with our dog food rings yeah. of stuff, and then we get you know the scenarios we get and and this is how this is the right way to do it in my opinion when we test software and it breaks on our internal people why would we ship it right we've got we've got to go slow we have to slow down i know there's the whole concept of you know fail fast fix fast but that only extends to so what you know to within a certain uh kind of paradigm if that makes sense yeah so yeah, there's some things that we that we we see and it's like holy crap. <laughs> Sorry for the language, but let's just not do that to our customers right now. Well, let's uh, see. We're already we've got uh, uh, 60 minutes left, um, so we've got time to to get through some questions. Again, for anybody that's watching uh, at, at, on Facebook and the live stream, uh, if you've got any questions, we are monitoring the the, the questions. So ask away. But we've got a number of questions that come from. The Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, M365, Azure communities on Facebook, and we're going to go through as many as we can here. So let's uh, kick things off with question number one. Oh wait, hey Hal, uh, in your homework, do you want to do you want to share the update on your homework from last time? Um, do you still have that email open? Do we want to come back to that? Um, my my dog ate it. <laughs> no, the uh, and I have it here. Okay, so let me. I'll re-ask the question. So this this question was. Let me find it here. In my notes. Um, so Zeke had asked the question. Um, he was tasked to gather Office 365 email filtering settings to be provided to an auditor. What's the best way to gather this? So a screenshot of the spam filters or malware malware filters. Um, what are the other options to capture those? Well, um, from the standpoint of just looking around, there's nothing I could find that was really obvious about how to gather specific settings. Uh, however, there is quite a bit of stuff on uh, how to manage the settings, both by a, either a PowerShell, uh, either using PowerShell or by using a GPO. Um, and uh, I increased, I got a couple of links for that. Which I'm going to see if I can actually paste into the chat here, if you'll let me. Do, 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 do. It says paste and bang. There we go. Right. Um, and uh, so the, the, the thing that is, uh, there's there's two different sets. PowerShell looks like to be the way he's probably going to want to do this. Um, I found a couple of the two articles I've got. Uh, that I, I posted there both deal with uh, using PowerShell. Uh, the first is uh, for on-prem, and the second one is, I think that's the order I put them in. I just see the one. one I just see the one link so far on there, Hal. No, nope, there's two links. There's two. Just wait, at least there's two links the... here. 
It just oh. shows this one oh, big blob. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. It just shows this one big blob, but there's That's two right. links on Because it converts it so, to the titles now. Yeah. Thank you, Microsoft, for doing that and then making it confusing. Excellent. Conserving. And so, so with that, it, there's considerable setting he can do as far as enabling and, and changing filters. So it, And I didn't get into it far enough to see if he can actually do querying, but I'm fairly certain that if you can set something, you can query its settings. So. Uh, and you can set and reset filters uh, using using this methodology. Excellent. And it looks like I say PowerShell would be the way you want to go. All right. And uh, let's see here. So I pasted those over in the chat. And all right. So let's jump into question number one. Thanks, Hal, for the, the homework item. Um, Community question number one, Vivek says, hello team. Has anyone configured Microsoft Teams group membership dynamically using another Active Directory security group or mail-enabled security group? Microsoft 365 group membership provides dynamic membership queries, but does not provide any rule or query to map any security group. Any other way if someone has achieved it or from Power App? It doesn't sound like it. I mean, I've done it through M365 groups, but that's like you're saying, you can't be dynamic with that. Um, usually with, I mean, I, I guess I need to understand dynamically how are they, how are they, how do they want the users added by it? Like AD attribute? Or, I mean, how does that person get dynamically added? Is it because they put a field in there that's like their office is finance and they are supposed to get automatically added to a group? I don't, I need to understand that because I, I'm almost sure if that's the case, then there's got to be a way to do it through the Graph API or the, through uh, PowerShell. All right. Sounds like everybody is just excited about that question, but. <laughs> I uh, yield my time. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. That's a thing now. You know, Sorry. Yield my time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's jump to question number two. Rohit asks, uh, hi, I am unable to see IIS server page after running shell script through custom script extension. Can someone help? Yeah. What do you, you mean by the IS server page? Yeah. Like the basic home page? <laughs> <laughs> you broke it. <laughs> I mean, you ran a shell script. Your IS doesn't work anymore. Am I do wrong? I mean, error, er, no, error messages would be useful. Anything in the viewer would be useful to help troubleshoot diagnosis. But just based on that, I mean, what is the shell script? What does it do? What is he trying to achieve? Maybe it's, you know, inside of the shell script, it's an RM star. So it's removing all your files. I don't know what the shell script is doing. <laughs> would you say in no. general, Mike, that that would be bad? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it's getting giving root access to someone outside of your company. And yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so it, 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 go ahead. it could be anything from, 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 you know, the service isn't running. There, there's so many possibilities here for what's broken that they, you need a little more context in terms of understand what the, what's going on here. That should be, it's, it's, can someone help? Absolutely, someone can help. We need more information. Yep. This is, a, for those that are dialing in, watching the live stream, the recording of this is like, so these are unedited questions coming from the community. And there are many of these that don't have adequate information for any kind of an answer. <laughs> uh yeah so exactly yeah this is uh yeah which is which is fine so if uh rohit if you're watching additional information um post it again to uh, out to the site um and we'll uh yeah we'll try to address it if there's additional information there all right, um, Adam, question number three. Uh, one of the clients that I collaborate with via Microsoft Teams 
would like to know the footprint that is left on machines during and after the collaboration. This ranges from simple one-to-one -one chats through to file sharing and meetings where no recordings are made. Is there a definitive source of information that can describe this? That's a great question. Um, you know, especially if you own, you know, auditing compliance and understanding that complete footprint of activities around teams where it, it, we, we jump to the two output sources is always the, the first answer. The documents that we upload and work with, um, the files that we attach or the meetings. And those are two the easy things. And, and below that would be all the chats, all of the conversations. But what is the total footprint? Yeah, everything. So with Teams, everything gets stored as most applications do under app data, right? Under, you know, if you go to um, the app data, what's, oh, what's the easy way to get to it? Uh, you, you send app data percent, right? That will that'll give you the, the app data. It'll take you to there. So everything gets cached there. Um, you can clear it. There's, and there's, I don't know, there's probably a way on, online if someone tells you how to clear it, but that will store kind of like instant cache of chat that doesn't have to be retrieved from the services from the server or the, the, the data store. Um, it'll keep the very most recent things, but that's pretty much as far as I'm aware, that's pretty much all gets cached. I'm, I can't claim to be the authority on that, but um, that cache can be cleared for sure. So I, I, I saw this question come in live uh, and, and so was you know, prompted in my notifications on, out on Facebook and and went in and somebody went in pretty quick and provided, I went looking for it because I had just found this from another conversation, a compliance and auditing discussion. Uh, and so I provided the link somebody had added to Facebook. So it's a location of data and teams link out on docs.microsoft. But then uh, it also had somebody go in and share the Office 365 IT Pros link for Teams desktop browser clients offline send that article. Um, so both great resources to help you outline everything that is captured within the footprint. So there you go. And, the, and by the way, and the links to all of these things, every question that we cover, as well as any links that we share, will be in the blog post out on buckleyplanet.com, and I'll have it up later tonight. But yeah, that is, uh, so that's great to have, you know, these two links, these for reference, but um, yeah, it's, it's good to be familiar with this, uh, especially if you get into uh, a, a compliance or a regulatory requirement to provide to understand that footprint. And, and hey, everybody, we do have a question um, from Paul out on Facebook. So we've got a live question here. It says, Paul says, uh, hello, all. I wondered if anyone could offer advice or tips on locking down the power platform and ongoing governance. We're looking to deploy power platform in a bank who have a lot of concerns around data leakage, et cetera. Uh, other than locking down the default environment or connectors and roles within Power Platform and creating new environments with the appropriate connectors, what else should we be thinking about? And any pointers to where you can find more info on best practices? Somebody got a DLP link? Yeah, it seems like the obvious response. I don't have one to hand. I can find one, though. Yeah, I don't either. I'll add this in and uh, yeah, let me Paul. Google that for you. You're going to Google it, Bing, are you? Is it Bing on Google? Does it matter which one? All right, while we're looking that up, great question, Paul. And uh, so we'll, we'll see if we do we want to wait for that or are you guys looking or? So I'm going to give you a gen generic link to the Microsoft security practices. Oh, crap. It's a horrible link. It's a search <laughs> link, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's OK. Let, let me find a better one. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's hideous. Oh, that yeah, is hideous. <laughs> that is wow. really, I'm Jeez. sorry. <laughs> oh, there we wow. Go. Who threw Try up that one? Use that one, Neil. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Here we go. 
That would be a bing. What they call uh, a bing puke or a bing, <laughs> yeah, puke. bing bang bung. Yeah. <laughs> uh, browser vomited. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I guess that's I can good. delete the message. It's my chat, right? I can delete it. Yep. Yes, you can. You should. We'll always have the memory, though. <laughs> it's gone away. There well, you go. Over in the the Facebook comment comments, it, it initially you know it, it converted it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's that's awesome. Okay. I so mean that is the root of the security side for the the security compliance center for the Microsoft side, but um, root. I'd hate have to, to do a little bit a little bit of digging to get <laughs> get yeah. to what you need. So I, that's that's a that's a great question though. All right. Uh, question number four, Maximilian says, um, hi, I want to try Power BI in the cloud. I need to collect data from two SaaS applications like Google AdWords and one visitor tracker. Moreover, I need to load data from on-premises SQL database. What's your recommendations? Using Power BI data gateway to load local data, uh, is it only loading Delta or pushing local data to Azure SQL or Blob? Do I need Azure Data Factory or Analytics Service? Or is it enough to use Power BI only for beginner or beginning? What is your recommendation? Call John White. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, four ones. Oh, he's 519. <laughs> <laughs> the Tiger folks. Yeah, realistically, what you're dealing with here is you're dealing with a architecture question. You, because there's 10 different ways that you could you know, create this data or be able to import this data. Um, Power BI is probably the answer for the manipulation and display uh, display of the data, but the input or the ingesting of the data, you know, should you use a data gateway? Should you put it up in SQL in a SQL database? Should you do this? Should you do that? That's all around what the data is you're going to be bringing in, what the frequency of the data you're going to be bringing in, um, and, you know, if you use an Azure service, it's going to cost you more than, you know, just bringing it in directly through a local gateway. Um, and then also, you know, what's your, what's your final goal? What's, what's, what's the whole goal of this? Is this something that's going to be like a living, something that's going to be living forever, or is it something that's just going to be a one shot deal? So there's, a, there's, uh, there's architectural questions around this, you know, um, or design questions, if you will. Yeah. And pretty much a uh, Microsoft uh, partner or consultant would be able to assist you with that, such as the ones that Sean uh, mentioned. John yeah. White, the Tigraph folks. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, question number five from Sion. Uh, anyone know any great syncing tools from local drives to SharePoint? including HTTPS connection. Please, this is not a migration. Uh, one drive Low hanging sync. fruit, one drive sync. Yeah. yeah. What's drive the sync. obvious thing we're missing here? Exactly. Yeah. But I don't Groove think uh, this Groove, th Groove to exe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. SharePoint <laughs> desktop, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this may just be an under a misunderstanding because they may not know that OneDrive is a back end for SharePoint. Um, you know, obviously OneDrive Sync will do it for you, but there are some third party tools out there that do it just as well, you know, or Microsoft, you know, Robocopy, whatever, you know, if you really want to do something complex, but uh, just drop it into a folder that OneDrive sees and you're good to go. <laughs> Still makes me laugh, Robocopy. <laughs> What's that? Still makes me laugh, Robocopy. Robocopy is I, is one it's of the most awesome Stone tools ever copy. made. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might be the new Hal. I'm not able to chat. <laughs> oh, I, my. I haven't I have an answer for you, but I'm not Sherry's able to chat. Sherry's socially stunted. <laughs> Maybe I'll just copy these and send them to you in an email, Christian, if I can't you can, chat. <laughs> hey, Sherry, you can also drop the link over in the Facebook live stream, and I can paste uh, it in that way. Okay, cool. Do you have the link for that? Because <laughs> I don't, I don't yes. watch my, I don't watch myself. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, well, that would be helpful, except I can't chat. 
<laughs> well, if you go if you go to my if you go to my page to okay. to my profile and you can find it. Okay. I said I could I could add the link over in the chat here, <laughs> but it wouldn't be so helpful. No, <laughs> yeah. considering I can't chat. I'm the new Hal. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm the new Hal. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number six. Uh, Shana says I am not able to open PowerPoint files uploaded in a Teams channel. When I click on the file, it would just spin and do nothing. What could be wrong? A world. Of the, the amount of I, enthusiasm we have today for answering questions just is just blowing me away. I have Sorry. an answer to that one too. I don't want to be the the my cog here. But I'm wondering if it's if when it says she's a, it's a PPT file, that right there. It has to be PPTX to be displayed in a web browser. You can't display a PPT in a web browser. So I'm wondering if it's her file format. She's not even saying oh. she's trying to display it in the web browser, though. Well, well she says it's well, an Office 365, right? Yeah, well, if, it's in a, if it's in a Teams channel, the default is it will open in embedded browser effectively within Teams, right? Within right. the Teams yep. client. Mm -hmm. Or if she's in Teams, through the browser, it will also open in the browser, you know, to Sherry's point. As, so PPT, does she mean PPT? Does she really mean PPTX? I haven't seen a PPT file in years. Not yeah, since we're talking about the application, not, but yeah. Not since the Evolutions Conference 2009 or something. <laughs> so if we're, <laughs> we're assuming it's the appropriate, it's a PowerPoint file that, that's in there. Um, I mean, is there something, is there a permissions issue that could be here with the, the data? You know, she, she, would be able to, she, she would be able to see it. Right. Because it would be security trimmed. Right. Hit F12, click on the console tab, and look at what it says. Get a little scene, a little shot behind I the mean, scenes of what's the, going on. Yeah. And, th and there's other things to think about here, right? Is it Does this occur in just this one channel? Does it occur in multiple channels within the same teams kind of um the same teams team if that makes sense um can One she browser open multiple other browsers powerpoints from sharepoint directly there's the, you know the there's a number of when we think about you know obviously my my background from a sharepoint perspective is in support as an engineer so there's a number of things that i would want to understand you know to you not just say what's wrong but more about what are the other experiences and do some things right. work do some things not and, and trying to kind of process of elimination basically the, when i have an issue like that I and mean, that's the first thing that i go and do can i open a powerpoint file in any other team and any other channel well first another channel within that team another team entirely is it also happening with word docs with excel files mm -hmm. you know other things is there a problem opening office applications which could indicate Maybe there's something with the version of Office that you're running. You know, who who knows? But that's that. Those are the things. Am I? How am I logged into that tenant? I'm sure this for the, those of us that use multiple tenants. Am I logged into a team with my Microsoft Community site? My login versus my company uh, uh, login. So you know, all, all things that you could look at that could potentially impact that experience. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, so that's another need more information. Yeah, as I'm looking at the little purple circle, I, I totally am empathetic to her right now. <laughs> 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 uh, all right, question number seven. Uh, Dublina says, uh, can we change contact info details of a guest user and Azure AD Sync users in Azure AD. You should be, there's a certain amount of element, certain amount of metadata you can change. Things you can't with the synced user is obviously you can't change the things like the email address, the, S, the, the you know, the um, UPN, UPN, UPN event, event, essentially, but there's some things you can change for sure. I'd have to go and look at the detail on what you can count, but you can. There's some things you can do for sure. I'm looking it up, and uh, am I on mute? 
No, no. Okay. Uh, no, I'm looking it up in the Graph API right now. I'm sure there's a way to do it. Um, if anyway, do the Graph API. I know you can't do it through the UI, the portal UI. So. So folks, I know it doesn't make for great television, but sometimes we're looking up the answers live here on air, and that's why you've got the like the little pauses. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it so, also builds the drama, I guess. So <laughs> that's good. We need theme music. <laughs> According like, insert, to this, insert so, Jeopardy theme here. I know that, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the, you know. Dun, dun, do dun, do dun. dun. <laughs> Mike, so yeah. yeah, yeah, so there is a way to do it um, to the graph API, and uh, I've got the link here. Uh, put it out there. Yeah, I mean, primarily the, the the way that Microsoft say that you should do it is if you if you need to modify the properties of a user in Azure AD, that's a user that's being synced from on premises. You just you yeah. you make the change on premises. Yeah, and then yeah, allow yeah. the sync. But if it's a guest user that was created in Azure AD, um, I don't know if they'd be able to modify that object. Well, they should be able to. Well, it's yeah. a difference between it's a difference between whether it's a synchronized user or a yeah, it's, user. or uh, in cloud user. Yeah, is right back enabled as well? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah, yeah, all those things have to be considered. Okay. Uh, question number eight, Gabrielle says, uh, anyone with SharePoint on-prem skills, Mike? <laughs> uh, this is web, you, app, Mike, yeah. <laughs> web app with anonymous access granted, no policy, site authorizes to enti entire site, the library with unique permissions, inheritance broken, still I can only check the view permission. Uh, the add edit checkboxes are grayed out, why? Hmm. For what? Web, web app synonymous. No. OK, no policy. Site authorized system. Hmm. The only thing I could come up with was creating a new permission level that you could assign that had that already. But um, and again, that's kind of need to know more information about the rest of the environment. And like, well, what are yeah, the permissions I, of the person trying to change the permissions? So the other, you know, it depends. Well, there's dependency on the version. You know, are we talking about an older version? Are they trying to look at an, a, a file or something? Are there underlying um, Windows permissions in play? If it's a file, I mean, all sorts of different things that could potentially be an issue here. Mm. I'm assuming that the, the, whether they're talking about view permission and add edit, um, that's on the ribbon, right? So it's so they're interesting to know who the like Gabrielle. If this is you and you have what permissions do you have to that site, mm -hmm. in that location? Yeah, because and everything else that she describes is it's view. Right, and also consider and that if, an, yeah. if anonymous access is enabled, is she logging in with anonymous access, or is she logging in as a person, as a, you know, a, as herself? What identity does she have when she's on that site? Yeah. Anonymous access in SharePoint on-prem is a really bad idea anyway. I would avoid it, like plague. Yeah. All right, yeah, that's so. A little bit more information, but we, I, I, I think it's just, uh, yeah. All right, I think we've answered that. It is what it is. Yep. Uh, number nine, uh, German asks. I saw in the message center where Microsoft announced they were increasing the interactive participant limit from three hundred to one thousand. The Correct. time. Time frame has been updated to end of April. Does anyone know how to confirm that the limit has been increased? I don't know if 300 people to test and see if my tenant has received the upgrade. Ooh, I don't know if there's a way to do that or not. Um, 
Well, all the documentation has been updated. You know, I actually don't know this question. So it, Microsoft announced it. Do they change the documentation? So if I go to docs.microsoft and look this up, do they change that once it's GA and been deployed fully? Or do they do that at the beginning of a rollout where your, your tenant may be on a slower ring and it's not yet updated? I don't think they do it until the entire ring is complete. I mean, to me, that would make more sense, but uh, um, because, I mean, why would you change the docs early for the early rings? And then the folks that are on the later rings are going to be like, how come, I'm, you know, I don't see this. I don't see the ability to do this. Unless they put a footnote, you know, or a header in there that says, hey, this is rolling out. This is actively being rolled out. Um, I don't know, but I don't know there's a way to check. Uh, if you receive something without actually like seeing a button created or seeing a checkbox or something, you know, something yeah, like that. I, I don't think there's a way to check. I do know that that update, because um, I had a customer talking asking me about this the other day, and they were they were saying they were going to start it in March and it would be complete by the end of April. Yeah. How do you validate it? I don't know. Um, like, the, like you know, to help to the house point, I, I don't think there's a way to. Truly this is, this has of, been a request for a long time of like in the message center updates, there should be some kind of indicator of what has actually been updated on your tenant. So you have that tenant view of that. So we get the broad announcements. We know that's going to happen within between March and April that this new feature is going live. Uh, and and you, you should know the ring that you're on, but there should be, it would be great to have some indicator that, to show that, hey, this is live on my environment now. I, yeah, I mean, and I know, well, I know nobody wants to raise support tickets, but I know support can definitely tell you. You know, I, I have a dashboard that I can look at that will show me which updates and which, um, uh, you know, features have rolled out across different tenants and I can do individual tenant lookups, but that's because I'm part of that organization. Um, I don't think it's something that the individual tenants actually have. One thing I would ask though is whether the tenant are they on the you know if they're on the regular update ring versus the delayed you know, forget the what's the name of the thing you can be like you can you can delay your updates a little bit de deliberately if you wish. Yeah. Um, and I, f I forget the name of it. No, I guess it would depend on what what they on. But I would I would I would expect. That if they are part of the regular update ring, they will already have this, or they, you know, it's it's literally shipped. It's done. And uh, just had uh, Keith asking where the recording will be. Uh, so, oh, it's, come on. The other way to look at it is think about the, the roadmap. If you look at the actual roadmap, the roadmap will show you um, items that are in development, items that are currently rolling out, and items that are fully launched. So that's something else to think about. I've got right. the link to the roadmap in the chat window. Yeah. I think we all know it anyway, but good for the... And and by the way, we lost Sean. So I, I, he, I think he had to... That was just abrupt. Oh, so that... <laughs> It didn't work, but uh, all right. Um, I'll, I'll fix the link. I just posted the uh, a, a bad link. I'll just go and grab it. But um, yeah, misleading information happening in the chat over on Facebook. Um, all right, yeah, so Sean had to depart early for a, a client call, um, and we were offset by thinking Neil was going to join late, but we've had him the whole time, so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's all right, just, just threw us off. Uh, let's see. So question 10, uh, another he, question from Zeke. Oh yeah, he, sure. He, re he really just wanted to watch Jeff Teeper's keynote because he just, the keynote for the M365 just started. Ah, that's uh, right. So. That's what's going on. His <laughs> other meeting. That that's right. We'll call, we'll call it that. Uh, let's see. All right. So question 10, Zeke says, anyone know how to repair a corrupted word file? I have extracted it in open document.xml, but don't know how to find or repair line two column, blah, blah, blah. So repair a corrupted word file. Line two column 
537,837. Yeah. Definitely some line breaks missing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I well, Word no has a repair feature. I assume he's <laughs> tried that. You have to assume they did, Hal. I mean, that's just, we can't make any assumptions, though. So, yeah. They do I would make a, so, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, that's okay. Go ahead, Neil. I was I was going to say, you know, if he's got if he's got document XML open, then a assuming that the text in that document isn't corrupt and he can actually access the, the you know the basic text of the document that will be in the XML file, I would suggest the best way to do would be to just grab that file, grab the you know copy and paste the data out of it into even something as simple as notepad and open it create a new word document and go go start from there it depends how valuable the doc the content of the document is if it's a very if it's exceptionally valuable content to me i'm going to do the best i can even if it, it takes a lot of manual effort to make that happen yeah and i would then and I, would, I would also be concerned about you know why did this happen how did this happen be my next steps how do i stop it happening again yeah there are a third i'm sorry I haven't, seen, I haven't seen a corrupted document since the docx trends anybody else i mean it used to happen all the time in the doc files all right mm -hmm. so that but again that makes me wonder what format his file is in mm -hmm. um and but yeah, like i said I, I put a link in the chat for how to um, troubleshoot a document so hopefully yeah, that I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's a docx can give any can get access to the xml because the you know DOC was a very proprietary format, right? But yeah, I guess it's it's a, it's all about how much effort you want to put into the. For me, it's all about how much effort, how valuable is the content of that document, and how much effort am I willing to do to recover it? Yeah, yeah. I I don't know that I had a corrupted file. I'm trying to remember what what it was, but I mean one of the things that you also have as a resource is the versioning, is go back in the versioning. Yeah, yeah depending on where it was stored, you can't open it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. All depends on that. And there are third party tools that are created that will exactly. try and recover. But usually, I mean, they'll recover a portion of it and then they want you to pay after that back. Um, but uh, yeah, you're talking 53,000 some columns. I'm sure that you'll hit that uh, <laughs> that blocker right away. Yeah. It's actually 10 times up. <laughs> yeah, 533,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Question 11, Peter says, I am relatively new to SharePoint. I hope my question makes sense. I would like to use either tags or a custom column in documents to track the progress of reports by labeling them with such as tags to be dictated, to be uh, uh, to be proofed, to be sent, et cetera. Is it possible to have a dynamic folder in documents or elsewhere that could contain all reports with a tag to be proofed? Search is your friend. <laughs> it's a view so you create yeah. a you create that custom column then you create a view that filters for that mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's, it's, again i put that in the chat too so. yeah so if you do build that i mean that's one of the the another reason why if you're if you're using sharepoint as the primary interface you can use the list app over in teams and do that which is just a sharepoint list uh as well but yes create that and then customize the view Is question 12 connected to 11? Uh, do, do, do. Yeah. I was kind of wondering yeah. the same thing when I saw yes. it too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's, I, think Shari, uh, I, I think Shari's idea of the, the, the list views is probably the, the absolutely the right thing to do here. You know, I mentioned search. Search can be super helpful in a variety of ways, but it will probably take a lot more work to build a search, kind of custom search view versus a, a list view that, that has the right, you know, metadata um, show view when metadata equals whatever, that kind of thing. A little known trick too that a lot of people don't know about is when you create a view, let's say you have folders because they, people love to use their folders in SharePoint libraries. You can still use those custom columns on any document in any folder and you can create a view that ignores the folders so that it would show a roll up. And even if they're nested in a bunch of files, it'll show a roll up view of those attributes that you're filtering for in the view. 
So it's in in the SharePoint settings, um, in the view down at the bottom, this is show in folders, you deselect it. I think we should also comment uh, as a group about uh, Christian's inability to copy and paste correctly uh, for those last two questions. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's That's another it. way to look at this as well as a as a as a as a kind of a beneficial piece of you know SharePoint has a I won't say powerful workflow engine built into it, but it does have a workflow engine. So it's worth considering the workflow here when you're looking at you know tracking what items you know if you're looking at how many we need to dictate, what's to be proof, what's to be sent. Workflow reporting is also an interesting feature that will give you some of that functionality. Yeah. Won't let you view. You can't like view all items in a certain state, but it was certainly something that you should maybe investigate just as a view to thinking about, um, uh, you know, how you track the status of of individual items. Yeah, hey. do a lot of dynamic things like send out notifications when it's changed state. Um, yeah, yeah, when new items have been added. Um, yeah, there's a lot of creative things that you can do if you're trying to automate that workflow. Yeah, uh, when it when it's approved, it gets moved to the next stage, the next step. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. So uh, I thought you said another way to look at it is that Christian just doesn't care about the quality of his cut and paste. <laughs> uh, so I have a yeah. <laughs> I know Eric, you're you're Here. you're talking a lot, but no sound is coming out. <laughs> I know. I'm not complaining. I'm just stating so, a fact. Are we going to create like a swear jar for every time you have to say we're on mute? Like something? <laughs> but I wasn't on mute. I was just were. using the wrong microphone. Oh, okay. Uh, uh. Uh, let's see. Let's. So I have corrected the error in my cut and paste of the list. So the next one with Stephanie is actually question 12. Um, so Stephanie says, my organization is planning the transition from our Drupal internet to a SharePoint online intranet. May I ask how others are creating org-wide calendars? We have like, we've had a few calendar questions over the last couple of weeks. We need a calendar that is viewable by all staff and is editable by a few. It will include things like closings, committee meetings, upcoming trainings, et cetera. What's the best way to do that? SharePoint online. Um, I could take that one if you want. This is sure. this is my this is my baby. This is the ones I love because let's make things easier for people. Have one centralized calendar that um, you, again the permission groups have to be set up correctly, and then anybody with an authenticated address can view it. And then you can in, at the department level, if you have other um, departments or calendars that have to be managed and you want to centralize that information you just do a calendar overlay so you take that same calendar and you put it on top of your departmental calendar so you can see the you know both and you can create color codes for those so uh, again put a link in the chat for that one i love calendar overlays it's one of my favorite things yep you shouldn't have to duplicate across 20 calendars the same information just so people can see it where they're working Agreed. If yeah, there I, I wrote something about this in my SharePoint 2010 book. So yeah, for those that are still using SharePoint 2010, <laughs> isn't it get didn't it get uh, isn't it out of um, support now? Doesn't mean people aren't still using it. Is that it's still a thing? 2010 it sounds so long ago. It I was know. a long time ago. It was so like one digit away like so now we're into the twos people <laughs> yeah uh all right question 13 jury says when i call to any users uh, when i call to any users the call drops immediately how to resolve the team's call dropping issue my first comment is that uh, are you sure they aren't just hanging up on you that would be the first thing to verify mike you don't like that fake advice <laughs> And it's telephony related. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this, Mike, 
this happens to me too. It annoys. I'm holding my breath waiting for the answer on this one because it happens to me. I'll join a call and it goes bloop and it, it cuts, it drops it right off. And then I'll join back and it goes bloop. And then if I join from the browser, then it'll it'll join it for some reason. And the client, it just immediately drops as soon as I join a call or start a call. So I would love to know if one of you fabulous gentlemen have an answer to this question. <laughs> I like that with the telephony call and Eric departs, <laughs> doesn't say goodbye, just says he's leaving, gone. So I, what I see in my head is the road runner with the little poof behind him, Choo, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, you know, I've not experienced, uh, so I don't know enough detail around this, I mean, where I've experienced um, dropped audio or video. It's usually network related issues. I don't know that I've experienced this on just the telephony side. Oh, oh, he did leave a note that says gotta hop. Okay. And with a heart. So you can't you can't rag on the guy for, for when he leaves the heart <laughs> symbol there. So you know. We we heart you too, Eric. <laughs> um yeah, so um, I, yeah, I, that's a punt for me on that question. Okay. I mean, other with network issues, are there like known issues with call dropping? Mm. <laughs> telephony, <laughs> telephony punt. Telephony thing. Yeah. <laughs> All Sorry, together Drew. now, let's go like this. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what we need that meme. That's what we need. We need to have all of us doing this. And I like the disclaimer. I need to hit the button and have that visual. All right. Next number question, four, please. 14. Jose says, is there any extra cost for the company to assign a second admin role to an existing user in Teams? Um, do, do I need to buy another license for a second admin role? Just assigning a second no. role, like no, your license is your license. I mean, that user has to be licensed. Yeah, they can't be like on the free plan. But I'm thinking from an organization because you're talking about an organization standpoint, mm -hmm. company. So no, you don't have to pay. I don't know if there's a limit on the number of admins you can have, but I know I have probably four admins on one tenant. <laughs> Well, there's also a difference in types of admins. Like, so if let's say you're a, you can be a billing admin, right? So you get access to the costs, or you can be a user admin, so you can create users, re re uh, reset passwords, that kind of thing. But this is from um, a Teams. Be, this is from a Teams admin, though. Did yeah, but I don't think I think I think, the, I think the model is pretty much the same. I don't think right. I don't think there's any 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 like you have a specific license for a specific type of admin. And if I'm a you know, because I okay. If you can, just, I can just make everyone like equivalent of global admin. Yeah, you could do that. You could go in if you're a small business and there's ten of you, and and there's things that you're doing. You can make everyone a global admin. Well, and I have a global admin that's not licensed. Like, I mean, it's got the very lowest license you can have, which because is it, it what really it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't have the apps or anything, so. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like five bucks a month or something. That actually, that's actually interesting, Sherry, you bring that up because <clears throat> from a security audit perspective, one of the things that I've run into several times is people give the global admin or the owner, because you all have an owner, right? An owner is another permission. Right. Uh, but people give them like a license for everything. And, mm -hmm. every, and I'm like, you need to have a global admin that has nothing. Okay. Because they don't need a uh, global admin should not e need any applications there should be nothing that should be assigned to a global admin or even the owner if that's their role yeah. is just that admin access yeah but if they're a another user again a small business it's more likely that they're going to have multiple but that roles. should be but that should be a still it should be like from a security aspect it should be a separate user okay than what you log in as it's like me logging into a uh, uh, Windows box. I shouldn't log in as an administrator. I need to log in as myself. Or Good point. Log, you yeah. know. Yeah. And the, log the in as thing, yourself. You shouldn't be admin. And the only reason I have a license on it is because it has to have email. 
it has there are yeah. certain things I use it for that it has to receive an email for. So yeah, I don't that, even do I don't even do that when I set up mine. I have it. I have actually the global admin doesn't even have access to email. <clears throat> I have all those emails set to me as a billing admin or as a you know a uh, tenant admin or not a tenant admin but a uh, in light in uh, lighthouse it's a uh, another role I can't remember for the tenants for the multiple tenants um, but as a global admin they got nothing and and it shouldn't be administrator at tenantname.com <laughs> You know, because that's sure just a, too easily guessed, right? I'm sure there's a bunch of content that's out there, but Mike, that sounds like a great blog post. Yeah. You know, of uh, uh, what the you know, recommendations for setting that up. Yeah. I, I'm a, there's only five of us. It's a small business. I don't need, you know, yeah. I, I don't know about an, an enterprise if you might need to have multiple people that where you kind of disseminate those duties on, on different accounts, but it's just me and five other accounts. So Right. And I understand it's a small organization, but you still need to protect yourself because right. you are a business. So, you know, that's the first thing is that, like you said, administrator at xyz.com. It's easy enough to, to figure out, oh, let's just try this admin, administrator account and let's just take their address and put it in as a password or let's just, and they don't have MFA set up. So, you know, yeah. then it goes through a brute force, you know, it's like, and <laughs> it's like the people in my neighborhood that still have Linksys as their router name. Yeah. Come on. Or I've got, I've got okay, I'm not going to name the name. I'll, let's just uh, call him Tommy. But it's his Tommy's network, and everybody knows who the guy is. <laughs> and it's like, dude, you do uh, exact, and he doesn't everybody, have. Everybody, it, everybody. <laughs> and it's not secured. That. You can just tap right into it. My kids, when I'd shut the internet down, being a mean old mommy, they'd pick up on his because they knew it was right next door. It's yeah. Like, so. Well, and that's 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 obvious. That's that's just the Wi-Fi portion of it. And not to get off on a tangent here, but I had my neighbor, who's <clears throat> not necessarily technically, uh, a, you know, adaptive to new technology, um, bought a printer. <laughs> And these new HP printers automatically make themselves a Wi-Fi access point right. and with the HP printer name. If you set up the cloud print, because part of the – and cloud print is checked by default when you go through the installation, uh, which I think is just incredibly stupid. But uh, they set it all up. They had cloud print. They had the access point. They had no password on the access point. I saw it pop up, connected to it, typed in a nice little Word document saying, hey, I can see you. Uh, you know, you're, I, I, I can see you through your windows. I, I'm watching. You're watching the TV. You know, uh, and her, his his wife was out uh, working in the yard, and I said, "Oh yeah," and and Janet's out in the yard working. You know, and he's like freaked out. Just, I mean, he's like, you know, and I walk outside, and he's like, "You got to help me. You got to help me. Somebody's like hacked into my network, my home network, and everything." I'm like, no. That was me. <laughs> Lesson and, learned. Uh, then are you surprised by the restraining order, Mike, at all? <laughs> I only got access to the printer. That's it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's funny. That just reminds me of like the old days where I, so I worked for my first tech company back in 91, 92. Uh, and we had a fax based uh, system. So we were a reseller of computer hardware. And so we worked directly with Hewlett Packard and their facility out in Rockland, California. And we managed their warehouses and all that. And we resold equipment. So people would globally like, oh, I bought a brand new monitor and there's a scratch in it, send it back. It would go all the way wherever it was in the world to Rockland. Like, I don't know what that costs back in those old days of the huge CRT 80, monitors. 80 pound monitor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, and then we would touch up the paint and then resell it. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but we would do this, what was called broker fax, and send out uh, nightly. We had the Paradox database. We had multiple phones, and it would just roll out of all the items, the new inventory. Every single night, we'd send out to hundreds of resellers around the world um, this, this fax service. I ran that service, and we found that we, we would, uh, if, to our phone line, get calls all the time. Long story short, ter, shorter. Uh, is we just this this fax line kept calling repeated repeated to our phone line, and so we ended up somebody in my team screaming like this is a this is not a fax line stop calling this, and the people heard it through to their a, fax to line a fax machine <laughs> yes 
and they could hear it. There was still audio in their fax machine. They could hear it, this little, the sound, but the voice come through distinctly of the person screaming. And they called to complain about, I think there was some not kind words used in his rant. Um, but the person not heard PG-13. it. No, heard it through the fax machine, had it swear at them, and then called their company and be like, oh, this is going on, and be like, Gave them the right number. They had the wrong number, obviously. But uh, anyway, just uh, hmm. love that old fax technology. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. We've got a we've got a couple minutes left. Just over five minutes here. They had to keep the speakers on on those old fax machines, just like that, because once upon a time it was a manual connection back in the days when uh, right. you made your phone call with your voice and then you plugged your phone into a cradle. That's right. yep. where all that yep. comes from, and of course yep. that. In order to accommodate them, the speakers have to stay on. Good so, old war yeah. games. War games when you pick up the phone. Yep. Yeah. The computer called them. You had to put it on there. Fax, fax was fax was one of my special computers. world way back a number of years ago. Science. Was printing and imaging, and uh, yeah. the imaging part like is that ZX similar. Spectrum loading a game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, question number fifteen. Kem Lesh says. SharePoint Online has provided me options to embed Yammer and Twitter content easily. How can I embed a public LinkedIn page feed? This is web link. Do you have a web part for web links, Jerry? There is a there is a web part, right? For the content viewer web part. You yeah, can just content viewer. URL and, yeah. Right. Well, yep. or wow. You can do um it's just a web page and you put the URL of the page. Right. But mm -hmm. but it, it it doesn't to me it doesn't clean it up because you've got the it puts the whole page. Right. So There's you're, not you're a getting the header for that. and the right. yeah, you're yeah, not you're getting get the just thing. the content. Yeah. But you could also I've saw knew someone that did an RSS feed. So if you have oh, a okay. website yeah. that just says RSS feeds of the articles, which you can get from LinkedIn, then there is is there an there is an RSS RSS web part for SharePoint yep. or not? They, well, they used to be. I don't know if it still is, but it definitely was back in the day. Is there an RSS feed for for posts and updates for LinkedIn? I think there is. I think you can. There's an RSS icon on mm -hmm. your on your page that you can click and get a link to the RSS feed. I've not tapped into now, that. Now you're making me curious. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's gonna go look, yeah, and Mike's gonna be wrong. We're just going to feed, we're going to feed Christian all the, tri the yeah. trips for his yeah. session on. Wednesday. Of course. <laughs> nah, it's already, it's already built. Uh, um, all right. Last question. I think this will be the last question. But uh, Bo says, uh, I have a SharePoint online list. The list has a column for every hour of the day. So one through 24. I would like to minimize the width of the columns so that I can see most, if not all of the columns without panning side to side. It seems you can only drag the column width down to around one and a half inches and no further. This ends up eating up a lot of screen real estate. Is there any simple workaround for this? I've got it, folks. Buy an extra wide monitor. <laughs> oh, shrink your, shrink the font size. Use, use your zoom settings and go down to like 50%. Yeah, that would work too. Yeah, I, so I don't yeah. know if you can do a JSON formatting or something on the list, to, but that's not mm -hmm. my jam. I, that's a complete guess. So I don't know. Can you because you can create different list views where you used, you used to be able to using formatting, but I don't do that. I don't like it. It breaks. Yeah, so just going back to the previous question, there is an RSS feed link, and SharePoint does still contain the RSS feed viewer web part. All right, there you go. And knowing's half the battle. GI Joe. Here's the. I was working on it too. Here's the. Because I got so, curious. <laughs> Neil, you're actually saying I was right. Holy crap! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't happen often, of Mike. <laughs> yeah. Make sure. Again, yeah, Mike has <laughs> Mike secretly has all of the SharePoint answers. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yes, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, any other ideas of how? So, no judgment calls on on what he's trying to accomplish with sizing of the columns and twenty four columns for every hour of the day. It's like he has his reasons for doing that. And outside of an extra wide monitor or reducing the font size, so increase the visibility of that list. Is there a way to go in there and decrease the width of those seemingly 1.5 inch? That seems rather large, but is there a way yeah. to increase the column I, size? I, so I would, I would ask another question here um, back to Bo, um, which would be, what is the actual um, column format? Is it text? Is it numerical? Um, because that might also affect the way that or the sizing that, that that's available for the column based on the based on the format. And um, I would assume it's numer it's integer, right? Therefore, it should be as small as it can possibly be. But I think that would also have an impact in terms of how big it can be and which white space is allowed. Okay. Well, and with that, oh, we are. Oh, well, the, I, I'm going to one more thing, Christian. Sorry. Oh yeah. The other, yes. op the, the other option is consider the fact that the, the that the columns in a SharePoint list ultimately still are just what HTML, right? That, that ultimately that's what gets rendered. So you could also consider looking at a custom CSS style sheet for the site that might, you know, based on the based on the on the the column, uh, the column has a has a, a name a value you might be able to modify the css rendering of that as well okay i'm done okay. all right <laughs> well thank you so much for that and thanks for everybody of course uh you know eric eric and sean uh who who uh who couldn't make it all the way through so uh it's, it's great that uh that the four of you were able to stick with it um, that means a lot. You'll, your bonus will be extra large this year. <laughs> uh, but with that, uh, uh, we'll be back next week. Of course, for those that uh, are watching the, the recorded or watch the live stream, uh, all of the uh, a link list with all of the uh, message center updates, as well as every question that we discussed with all the links that we provided through the chat throughout, We'll all be in a blog post out on buckleyplanet.com. It'll be out this evening uh, over on YouTube and the Collab Talk page on YouTube as well. The recording will be there. And so we'll share it through the various social channels. You can continue to get in touch with us. Just reach out to us individually uh, through social channels. Uh, but if you have other questions you'd like to post, you can DM me through the various places, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you find me. And uh, we'll be sure to add the question to our list and we'll be back to tackle more of your community questions uh, next Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific. And so with that, thanks everybody and we'll see you again next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Let the light shine through for you.